So in this hour, we want to turn our attention to, okay, if we're not going to read the Bible like that, how do we read the Bible? How do we find out what God wants us to do? How do we discern what God wants us to do? Because everyone who reads the Bible does at least a three-step. Now, sometimes we think we're doing a two-step. Okay, I'm not talking about dances here. I, I don't know how to do a two-step. So I, don't, don't know, I don't know how to dance that way. But a two-step would be, the Bible says it, therefore I do it. Okay. But we don't do everything the Bible says. We make distinctions. We make distinctions between Noah and us. We make distinctions between the Old Testament and New Testament. We make distinctions between the ministry of Jesus and the New Covenant. We make distinctions between what's cultural and what's not, what's temporary and what's not. We make all kinds of distinctions. We don't just read the Bible and do it. We read the Bible and we discern what to do. There's this process of discernment or hermeneutics or interpretation. And we all do it. Whether you're working with uh, kind of the, the method I grew up with, and read the Bible that way, you're still discerning. You're discerning between what's a good example and what's a binding example. You're discerning between what is a probable inference and what's a necessary inference, right? You're, you're discerning. You're making decisions. And you're making decisions based on something. Based on how you're reading the Bible. So we all do a three-step. We read the Bible and then we do hermeneutics, interpretation discernment, and then we draw conclusions about what God requires of us or what, how we participate in the work of God. So the question is, what sort of discernment do we need to use? Do we use a discernment that has an expectation of a blueprint pattern analogous to an architect? Or... Do we use a process of discernment that seeks to understand the gospel? That seeks to understand the story of Jesus and of God and the Holy Spirit. And that the story then shapes us. Now, when I say story, don't hear me wrong. Some people think, oh, you're saying story, you're, you're talking about fictional stories. No, 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 I'm not. I'm talking about what is the, the story of Jesus. It's not fiction. The story of Jesus is the reality of the incarnation and God becoming human and living and dying and rising again. That's, that's a true story. It's a historical story. All right? So when I say story, hear me in terms of narrative, a narrative reality, the reality of Jesus Christ and God. So do we find, do we construct the pattern, or do we live within the story? Or to put it a, another way, do we build a temple, or do we enter the temple and explore the temple? Do we create a pattern out of the stones scattered across the field? Or do we enter the palace of God, the narrative of God, the story of God, and seek to embody and live out that story? I think it's the second one. And that's why I would call Jesus is the pattern here. And let me try to explain what that might mean and what it might look like. Let's begin with a, a text from Paul. You want to open your Bibles again to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. He says, beginning in verse 1, This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. 
For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you. And how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I wrote about in a few words. A reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not yet made known to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now I want to sit here for a while. Because I think Paul tells us exactly how he wants us to read what he wrote. Did you catch it? Paul says, this is why I'm writing. This is why I write. This particular letter, for sure, But I think we could say Paul's writing is characterized by this standard. And the standard is the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. Or another way he says it is the mystery of Christ. Now notice the language. Let's let's watch it carefully. The mystery of Christ, which is no longer a mystery, right? It's been revealed. We know the content now. We know what it is. We know what it's about. We know what it does. We know its function. We know its story. We can put it in that language. Because the mystery of Christ has been revealed. It's not a mystery any longer. It's a mystery about the Messiah. Or it's a mystery that belongs to the Messiah. You could hear it either way. It's the Messiah's story. It's the Messiah's, it's the mystery that the Messiah accomplished through the gospel and made the promises to Abraham available to all people, Jew and Gentile. That's the story. So Paul says, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Okay, I didn't get this from listening to the philosophers. I didn't get this listening to the academics. I didn't get this listening to the farmer. <laughs> you know. I got this by revelation. God revealed this to me. God has shown me the mystery of Christ, and I have an understanding of this mystery. For in verse 4 he says, to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. So Paul's making a claim that he understands the mystery. That he knows what it is. He knows what it does. He knows its function. He knows its boundaries. He knows what the gospel does and what the gospel is. And that's what he wants to communicate. So that when he writes a letter, he says, I want you to read it in verse 4. When you read this, it will enable you to perceive or discern, or understand my understanding. I want you to understand what I understand. I understand the mystery of Christ. And I'm writing this so that you will understand it. So that when you understand it, then you can embody it. You can live it out. You can participate in it. I want you to know what the mystery of Christ is, not just with your head knowledge, but with your full body. I want you to know it. I want you to live out the mystery of Christ. But I'm writing so that you can understand the mystery. And he says, and I told you this in a few words already. Now we're in chapter 3, right? And Paul says, and I've already written about the mystery briefly in a few words before chapter 3. Now, I was just telling my math teacher here, the guy who should have taught me math. Where's where's my math teacher? Ah, we got several math teachers. 
Oh, there he is back there, right? Uh, I told him, I, you know, math. I never made above a C in math. You know, I don't know why. Probably because I didn't care. I mean, that's probably why. You know, <laughs> you know. Uh, as long as I could do my baseball statistics, that's all I needed. You know, that, that, was, that was the limit. You know. that, that's, and I could do those. You know. Now it's a lot more complicated. These baseball statistics are a lot more complicated. I couldn't do them now. Where was I going with all that? Okay. All right. Uh, so Paul's understanding of the mystery. Um, when he wrote it a few words, the previous two chapters, we're in Ephesians 3, so he's referring to Ephesians 1 and 2. You want to understand the mystery of Christ? At least the way Paul's thinking about it right here? What he means by that? What is the content of that? What is it, the mystery that he wants you to understand? The reason he's writing? The reason he's an apostle? The very work of God that has united everyone in the same body, Jew and Gentile, through the promises to Abraham, through the Gospel of Jesus? You want to understand that? Read chapters 1 and 2. Now in chapters 1 and 2, what do you get? You get... The story of God who initiated redemption. God who elected us in Christ Jesus. God who adopted us through Christ Jesus. God who turned the world back right side up under the headship of Christ Jesus. God, who in and through the blood of Jesus, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Who God sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Where Paul says, I pray for you that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened, that you might understand what it is God has done for you. That you might know that God is at work in you with the power of the resurrection. That you might become all that God intends you to be. <clears throat> Remembering that you were dead in your sins. And God, through His mercy, saved us. And has lifted us, raised us, raised us up, and seated us in the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. Not of works which you have done. That you might boast about it. No. God saved you. And God called you. And formed you. And created you. To be a people of good works. That God has prepared beforehand. So that you might be a part of one body, one Christ Jesus, who is the new humanity in which Jew and Gentile share life together and are built up into a temple of God. You are the temple of God by the power of the Spirit whom wherein God dwells through the Spirit. That's the mystery of Christ. That's it right there. It's that story. Not a word about a blueprint pattern. Not a word. Paul is defining, or at least describing, in some detail, two chapters worth, in a letter that is designed to, to not only be to Ephesus, but is a circular letter to the churches in the region. It's, a, it's designed to be a general letter to churches. Not addressed to a specific situation, like Corinth had specific problems, right? But Ephesians is not that kind of letter. It's more of a general letter. Kind of a, a, a white paper sort of letter that offers the Gospel in a full picture. And Paul is concerned to tell us what the mystery of Christ is. 
What is it? It's the gospel. It's the story of God through Jesus, what God did through Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit. The gospel is about what God does. Now, we respond to the gospel. We'll talk something about that tomorrow morning when we talk about Paul and how Paul reads Scripture and how Paul uses Scripture. We respond to the gospel, but the gospel is what God does, not what we do. And the pattern is not what we do or what the church did. The pattern is what God did in Christ Jesus in the power of the Spirit. And that story is not a story that's limited to Acts and the Epistles. It's a story that is from creation to new creation. From the beginning to the new heavens and new earth. It's the story of God creating and calling. It's a story of creation in the sense that God created a world in which we might inhabit to be His imagers, to reflect the glory of God, to fill the earth with the glory of God, and to rule with God, and to co-create with God. That's what you do when you have children, right? You co-create with God. Even Eve said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a son. With the help of the Lord, I have a son. His name was Cain. Then, Then the other one was Abel, right? So creation is the beginning of that story. And Israel's part of the story. Notice what the gospel is. It's the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. Because God chose Israel, chose Abraham, and said, through you, Abraham, I will bless all nations. And Paul says that when Israel, uh, as Israel is God's chosen, we Gentiles are grafted into Israel so that we are the same people. We are the one people of God. We are in Christ Jesus, the one new humanity. So the story of Israel is the story of God at work. And when Paul uses Scripture, he quotes quotes God's Word to Israel. We'll see that tomorrow. When Jesus quotes Scripture, He's of course quoting God's Word to Israel, right? Because that New Testament thing didn't exist yet. So the story of God in Israel is a part of our story. It needs to function in our story. Not be dismissed and cut off and say, well, that doesn't apply anymore. Jesus didn't know that. Paul didn't know that. And then Jesus comes, right? God comes in the flesh. The Word became Flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He was a temple among us. We saw who God is in the flesh. We saw what what it was for God to become a human being, and what it means for a human being to be the image, the full image of God. And we see what God does when God is on the earth. What does God do? God announces good news. God announces the reign of God is coming. And the good news is the poor will hear good news. And the good news is that the oppressed will be liberated. The good news is that justice will come into the world. The good news is that the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. That's the good news. Good news is that the sick are healed and the dead are raised. That's what Jesus told the disciples of John who came and asked, are you the Messiah? What are we supposed to tell John? Tell him what you see and hear. That's what Messiah does. Teaches and does. right? Teaches and heals. And it is the essence of the kingdom of God. And that Messiah is obedient unto death. And that Messiah is then raised from the dead by God, by the Spirit. God raises Jesus by the Spirit and exalts Him to the right hand where He is our high priest interceding for us and pours out the Spirit on us that we might be 
renewed and revived in the image of God, that we might be the people who, re, who conform to the image of Jesus and go about talking about and doing what Jesus talked about and did. As we wait for His return to deliver us from the groanings that we still have. That's the story. I describe that story kind of in five acts. I think of the story of Scripture as this big drama, kind of like a, that has a plot. Five acts, creation, Israel, Jesus, the church, and then the new heavens and new earth. And it is that story that we are invited to live in. We're invited to live in that story. I think that's the pattern. The pattern is what God has done in Jesus through the Spirit. And we are called to participate in that story. I say, well, you know, that sounds good, but I mean, uh, how practical is that? Does that answer my questions? Should I be baptized? Answer that question from the story, right? I mean, that's kind of the challenge. How can you convince someone they should be baptized from the story? Don't you need a command example or something? Well, yeah, part of the story does have commands. But how do I know that command is not like, hey, Timothy, bring the books when you come? How do I know that command is not like, oh, yeah, women in Corinth, they wear veils. How do, how do I know that I should be baptized? Well, I get this question every now and then. When I used to teach undergraduates, I'm retired now, but when I taught undergraduates, uh, they never would let me teach freshmen. I taught freshmen one time. And they said, we're not going to let you do that again. I think they said something about retention problems or something, I don't know, something like that. I don't know. But anyway. Um, but at my upper level undergraduate classes, I had a course you know, called uh, uh, The Story of God, from God, God, Creation, New Creation, where, where I basically taught this story. If you want to hear how I teach that story, my book uh, called... Uh, 80 Days Around the Bible or Around the Bible in 80 Days. It's a kind of a devotional book that walks you through the story. Right? And that's kind of how I think about the story. Um, but I get this question. Because every time I, tell, I teach that story, I teach about baptism because it's part of the story. It's an integral part of the story. You know, Noah and water, right? I mean, there was something going on there. Cleansing, right? The Red Sea was a baptism. Um, Israel had its water rituals. Israel immersed the, the high priest before he would go into the Holy of Holies, immersed himself before he went in. I mean, water's a part of the story. And when we come to the story of Jesus, it's part of his story too. And so I had this, I get this question all the time well, why should I be baptized? I mean, it's. You know, I, I'm, I, I, I believe in Jesus, but I'm just, you know, baptism, you know, that sounds like more like a work or, you know, something to earn my salvation. I think I'll just wait on that. Maybe I'll do it someday, but it's not all that important. That's kind of, I get that attitude quite a bit in the last 15 years. I said, well, are you a, you're a disciple of Jesus. Oh, yeah. I, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I, and so you think of yourself as a follower of Jesus. You're going to follow Jesus and learn from Jesus. Yes, that's what I want. I want to follow and learn from Jesus. And I said, well, you, you want to participate in the story of Jesus. Because I know that language from the course, right? And I said, yeah, I want to participate in the story of Jesus. Y'all know where I'm going with this, right? then follow Jesus into the water. 
Jesus was baptized. He thought it was important. It was important to him. It was important to God because God poured the Holy Spirit out on him. And God said, you are my child. I love you. I'm delighted with you. God affirmed him in that obedience. It was a fulfillment of all righteousness, right? So it was an obedience. It was a moment of discipleship. Jesus was discipled by being baptized, becoming a part of the story, becoming a part of the kingdom of God's story in his ministry and begins his ministry and is empowered for his ministry. And he was, you see, don't you want to, have, don't you want to be a part of that? I had one young lady, we had this very dialogue. That night she called her parents and they both came down and they baptized her the next day. Yeah, I want to be part of that story. See, if we're living within the story, then we're going to be shaped by what Jesus does. What God does through Jesus. We're going to be generous people, as we'll talk about tomorrow. We're going to be merciful people, like God is merciful. We're going to, well, what about Lord's Supper? What are we supposed to do with that? I mean, how do we, how do we obey the command, do this in remembrance of me? Why don't we, don't, isn't that just kind of a, a command that's a, sort of a test of loyalty was to see if you'll do it or not. And if you don't do it, you're going to hell. If you do it, then we'll have to figure out how to do it. Um, it's part of the story. Table's part of the story of Israel. Those fellowship offerings in Israel were, you know, when you made sacrifices in Israel, there's only one sacrifice you didn't eat. That was the one you burnt up to God. And you gave it all to God. The other sacrifices you ate, or somebody ate, the worshiper would always eat the fellowship offering. And the fellowship offering is an animal you would bring because it's a thanksgiving, or you're making a vow, or you're honoring God in some general way. But you bring a, an offering, you kill the animal, then the, the priest takes the blood, pours it at the altar, the animal is then butchered, and given some of it's given to the priest, the rest of it, you take home and you eat. And you don't eat it by yourself because you're supposed to eat it all in two days. You don't eat it by yourself. You, your village eats it. Kind of like Hannah. You know, Hannah, after she had Samuel, she went down to the tabernacle. And you know what she took? She took some grain, bread. She took some wine. And she took a three-year-old bull. She was offering a, a fellowship offering, a thanksgiving offering. Thank God for Samuel. Three-year-old bull, that's a lot of meat. I, I have a good cattle friend. It might be hard for you to imagine that there's a big cattle person that lives in Nashville, but okay. He sells cattle in Kentucky and Alabama and around. So I asked him, and you may know better than I do, but I just asked him. That's that was my resource. I said, when you have a three-year-old bull, how much edible meat can you get out of a three-year-old bull? How much would you have to eat? And he gives me this lawyer answer. You know, a lawyer answer is, is something, it may be true, but it doesn't mean anything. You know, that, that's the kind of a lawyer answer, right? All right. So his, he says, it depends on how big he is. And I'm going... Duh. I mean, well, can you give me something in general? You know, just general. And he said, like, eh. And he, I don't know if he's right or wrong. Four to six hundred pounds. So Hannah's taking a bull down there. And she's going to get four to six hundred pounds of meat to eat that must be eaten in two days. Now, in my 20s, I might have handled something like 24 ounces. Yeah. Uh, today, six ounces is about it. What was she going to do? She's going to have a big party. She's going to eat with the village and celebrate the birth of Samuel, giving thanks to God. There's table all through Israel. And Jesus, His ministry was filled with tables. 
He did most of his teaching in the Gospel of Luke at tables. And we all know the table of the Last Supper, where Jesus said, I will not eat and drink of this again until I drink with you. With you. It's the story. I'm going to drink with you into my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. The story. Why would I want to participate in a weekly Lord's Supper? Not because I saw some implied command and a binding example in Acts 20, verse 7. But rather, what I saw in Acts 20, verse 7 was a group of people gathered to eat with Jesus and celebrate the resurrection. And a resurrection happened on that day, right? Remember, you know, he fell out the window and, and he was raised from the dead. Now, what are you thinking if you're sitting across the table from Utica saying, hey, you're alive, man, <laughs> you know. Uh, what was that like? Um, you think you're happy or are you sad? Jesus said he would eat with us. With us. When we're at the table of the Lord, we're eating with the resurrected Christ. It's not a time to be sad. It's a time to say, thank you, Jesus. Right? And celebrate that life has come and conquered. Death has been conquered. Where do we learn that from? From the story. Why would I want to do that on every first day of the week? Because first day of the week is resurrection day. And Jesus has given us a meal to eat with us. And what better day is there than resurrection day to eat with Jesus? See, the first day of the week, breaking bread and resurrection, that happens in Acts 20. It happens in Luke 24 as well. In the breaking of the bread, the living Christ is revealed. Luke 24, verse 35. So, baptism, table, assembly. Why would, I, why would I go to church? If there's no command to go to church, and there isn't. There's no command in the Bible. It says you have to go to an assembly. Not in Acts and the Epistles. There is in Israel, but not not in Acts and the Epistles. We see them gathering. Disciples gathered. But why would I do that? Because Jesus did. I get this question a lot. Why do you go to church every week? I don't see the point. Going to church every week. Ah, maybe go once a month. But, you know, not every week. Um, maybe, why should I go at all? Just a bunch of hypocrites there. Self-righteous folk. And think they're better than me. I, I just don't think I want to go. Well, you're a disciple of Jesus. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. I, I want to follow. You want to follow Jesus? Yes, I want to follow Jesus. You want to be like Jesus? Yes, I want to be like Jesus. Jesus went to church every Sunday. Oh, I mean, not every Sunday. Jesus went to the assembly. He went to synagogue every Sabbath. Luke 4, verse what, 16, I think, says it was his custom to go to the synagogue. Jesus went to the assembly every Sunday week. Jesus went to the regional gatherings, right? He went to the Passover. He went to the Feast of Tabernacles. He went, he went to the Feast of Dedication, which is not even in the, the law of the Old Testament. He went to that one too. He went to the assemblies of God. When the people of God gathered, Jesus went. You want to be like Jesus? You want to follow Jesus? You want to learn from Jesus? Jesus went to church every week. Were there hypocrites and self-righteous people when he went to church? Oh, yeah. They were there, too. But he wasn't going there for them. He was going there to love people and to love God and to be formed by the reading of the Torah, by the prayers. 
and by the tables, like a Passover or a Feast of Tabernacles. They had tables. Right? Feast of Tabernacles, you ate a meal every day with God. Jesus went to participate in the story of Israel and the story of God. And if you want to be like Jesus, you're going to be coming. And that doesn't mean you have to come to a building. It doesn't mean you have to be a part of some institutional church. It may mean that you're a part of a house church or you're a part of a church that meets in the park or whatever it is. But you are going to seek out the assembly of God's people because Jesus came to establish an ecclesia. My assembly. We usually translate that my church. I came to build my church. My assembly. And if you... If we don't gather with the assembly of Jesus, if we don't gather with the people of God, we're not participating in what Jesus is doing and what God is doing. So you see how the story forms us. And it's not just isolated commands that we pick out and put over here on a list. It's rather we watch how the commands and the examples and the inferences function within the story. I'm not against commands, examples, and inferences. We all use them. You're not going to get away from them. They're, gonna, they're, they're there. But what do you do with them becomes the question. Do we extract them and isolate them and put them on this list and make, oh, there's five and there's five and there's three? Or do we immerse ourselves in the story and see that when Jesus says in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, that God has given him all authority in heaven and earth, and he tells his disciples to go make disciples, baptizing them into the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all things that I have commanded. What is he telling them to do? To live out of the story. To continue the story. Not create a pattern that everybody has to discern and construct for themselves in order to be the right church. Now, is that a little more ambiguous? Yeah. Maybe. But you know, this is the way we live life. We live life out of stories, out of narratives. You have the narrative of your family, the story of your family. We have the narrative of our nation, the story of our nation. We locate ourselves by the stories that shape us and form us. And we have habits and practices that are a part of those stories. Do you stand up when the Star Spangled Banner is played? Why do you do that? Somebody commands you to do that? You might get beaten up if you don't. Maybe, I don't know. It depends on where, you, where it is. No, you don't stand up because there's some law that says you have to stand up. You stand up because it's part of your story. It's the story in which you live. Why are people baptized? Part of the story in which we live. Why do we sit around a table with Jesus and eat and drink? It's part of the story in which we live. It has meaning. It has significance. It tells us who we are. It tells us who Jesus is. It calls us to participate in the story so that we become people who, who follow Jesus into the water and follow Him then to the tables and follow Him by carrying our cross in obedience to God. And we will follow Him into death, and we will follow Him into resurrection, and we will follow Him into the new heaven and new earth. It's our story. And I think that's, that's a, um, a healthier, in my opinion, a healthier way of reading the Bible. Does it solve all problems? No. We're not going to solve all problems. That's a pipe dream. We're not going to solve all problems. But what does it do? It will form us into the image of Jesus Christ. 
He is the pattern. Thank you for listening so carefully. I appreciate it very much.